Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. DTW, Revoid, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Hello and welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. We've got a lot of news to catch up on that's happening right now. So uh, you can hold the phone lines while I bring you up to speed on what's going on right now live in Washington, D.C. The president of the United States is holding a press conference on junk fees, particularly targeted at airlines, while he is standing on the steps of the White House of the Rose Garden having this Hezbollah has just invaded Israel uh, using drones and blown up the border fence, a northern front now opening in Israel. Four hours ago, this White House assured the American public that they believed that their call to Hezbollah to not engage was being listened to. It took four hours for them to for Hezbollah to respond. The American government is right now ordering uh, an evacuation of its embassy staff, telling Americans in Lebanon to leave immediately. This is happening right now. Uh, the Biden administration four hours ago said they did not believe at this point Hezbollah, which is funded by Israel, it's a Shiite militia that has taken over parts of Lebanon, uh, that they would engage with Hamas. Um, the official warned that such an event would have an impact. Uh, the American president yesterday told Hezbollah to stay out of it or else we've moved an additional air carrier group into the um, Mediterranean headed towards Israel. We already have ships there. That was the American warning. We would be engaged if a northern front opened in the war. Such a northern front appears to be opening in Israel. Uh, dozens and dozens of drones and paragliders have come across from the northern border from Lebanon into Israel. This is happening right now. Again, the U.S. government is ordering the immediate evacuation of its embassy in Beirut, telling Americans to leave Lebanon immediately. Hezbollah has blown up the border fence between Lebanon and Israel in parts and are coming through the wall. And drones have come over from Lebanon into Israel, all happening right now as we start the program. Uh, the House Republicans are also in Washington, D.C. right now, voting for a Speaker of the House Steve Scalise appears to be the favorite for the Republican speaker right now and could possibly wrap up the votes today. House Republicans, a short time ago, tabled a motion to change the rules on how the speaker vote proceeds. That's something Steve Scalise wanted. He thought by killing this change in rules, it would help him. It appears that uh, he has the votes to do that, which means he probably has the votes to be Speaker of the House. This is all happening right now. It's a busy day. I have struggled, frankly, to put together the show today and to figure out uh, the order in which to uh, present things. Um, and with all the breaking news, I'm just going to take a somewhat devil-may-care attitude and proceed uh, and ask your grace grace uh, along the way. The phone number here, 877 973-7425. I want to go back to a comment I made on Monday. It was over some audio. I couldn't play it on Monday. Thank you again to KXNT in Las Vegas for letting me hang out. Uh, their studio was not set up for me to be able to play audio off my laptop, and I didn't have time to get it to Jim back in Atlanta to be able to play it. Um, so I want to play for you now because it's still relevant. This is Anthony Blinken the Secretary of State of the United States, and you should know, by the way, you should know this. Uh, last year, you know, every year in Atlanta, I do an event for Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And I take people to dinner. Uh, my favorite restaurant in the metro Atlanta area is called Table in Maine. And, and I didn't do it this year because of some scheduling constraints, but last year took a number of couples to dinner over a series of weeks up there. And uh, one of them, uh, the, the husband reached out to me 
yesterday and said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm with my church. We're stuck in Israel. We're on the Sea of Galilee. We think we're safe, but we're having trouble getting news or information. I was hoping you might pray for us, and can you tell us what's going on? He's texted me today and said his church group uh, from North Georgia has been able to cross over into Jordan and is headed to Amman, Jordan, the capital there, and hopes to come home uh, sometime in the next 24 hours. And he notes that the American government was of very little help. This was the story from Afghanistan as well, where Americans were fleeing the country. The American government was of very little help to the Americans. They have had to rely on European governments and the Jordanians to help them get out of Israel. Uh, They were not able to rely on the American government. And now the American government is, as of this very moment, telling Americans in Lebanon, uh, you're on your own to figure out how to get out of Lebanon, but get out. This is the same Secretary of State handling that. This is Anthony Blinken. Listen to this audio. What do you say about the argument that money is fungible? So Iran may have known this money is coming and used other funds to help fund this attack that happened. Iran has, ha, Iran has unfortunately always used and focused its funds on supporting terrorism, on supporting groups like, uh, like Hamas. Uh, And it's done that when there have been sanctions. It's done that when there haven't been sanctions. And it's always prioritized that. And again, I come back to the proposition that from these funds have always been under the law available to Iran to use for humanitarian purposes. These funds have always been available to use for humanitarian purposes, but Iran always uses its money to fund terror. This is Jake Sullivan now. You heard that. That was from Sunday. Relevant now to Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor. Listen to this. We have not yet had a dollar of that $6 billion spent, and I will leave it at that. But will you refreeze it based on this activity that you just laid out, all of the ways that they are complicit in this? The administration said that if we see them going in the wrong direction, that we would stop that down. I understand the position that you guys have, that not a dollar of this has been spent. But will you prevent it from getting into their hands to allow them to, you know, do, do what they do that you just laid out? Let me just reiterate what I said, because it's unequivocal. Not a dollar of that money has been spent, and I will leave it at that. Not a dollar of the money has been spent. I will leave it at that. But thus far, no conversation about taking it back. Now, They don't know, and there is uh, intelligence conflicting as to whether or not Iran played a direct role in helping Hamas this time, but it doesn't really matter because they're so overwhelmingly tied to Hamas and Hezbollah. Uh, Regardless, here's a little more Jake Sullivan. That's a question for you to ask uh, the Israeli government. Um, Obviously, uh, the Israeli government has placed a high premium on its intelligence capacity as it relates to Hamas, as it relates to the West Bank, as it relates to Hezbollah. Uh, And uh, why it is that they did not have warning from this is not a question that I can answer from this podium. What about U.S. intelligence? Was there anything in what crosses your desk that would suggest that this was coming? We did not see anything that suggested an attack of this type was going to unfold any more than the Israelis did. And in your meeting with, in the Situation Room today, we saw an image earlier. Uh, at some point, undoubtedly, in the last few days, the president has seen the images of the dead Israelis. What has been his reaction when shown those images? I mean, you've seen him now twice. You've heard his voice. And this has been a deeply emotional time for all of us. As I'm sure it is for many people in this room who know people <clears throat> or know people who know people who are killed or who are missing. And all of us have developed close relationships with our Israeli counterparts. President Biden has a decades long relationship with Prime Minister Netanyahu, and he can hear the pain in Prime Minister Netanyahu's voice when he talks to him. I hear the pain of my counterparts when I talk to them. So this is not just about policy or strategy. This is personal for us, and it's personal for the American people with their bonds with the Israeli people. And so President Biden has seen and felt the deep emotional resonance of this, but he has also held the conviction that his job as president is to make sure that he has the clarity of mind and purpose to take the actions necessary so that we are standing with Israel in its hour of need, so that we are working to deter a widening of this conflict, and so we are getting Israel the tools that it requires to defend itself. (sighs) You, You get all this, 
you get all this. We're with Israel. We're with Israel. But we're not 100% against Iran. We're still willing to help fund Iran. Uh, by the way, you should note that uh, the reporters who have noted the American statements on Americans getting out of Lebanon are now saying that uh, there's ambiguity actually in the statement uh, that American embassy staff are uh, being told not to report into work. Uh, there's a question as to whether or not Americans are being told to leave now. Uh, but the American embassy staff in Lebanon are not to report to work. Uh, and But the same reporters are confirming Hezbollah is moving into northern Israel. The situation is escalating pretty rapidly um, up there. So uh, stay tuned here. We'll keep you up to date on this. There's one more piece of audio I, I got to play. This came out yesterday. Remember again, it is not actually in dispute, and, and you do need to know this. In all candor and intellectual honesty, the $6 billion that we have uh, repatriated to Iran, it was in bank accounts that were frozen. We allowed $6 billion of it to go into a bank account in Qatar. The Qataris are not our allies, although we claim them as our allies. The Qataris are on Iran's side in this. In fact, Qatar has developed such good relations with Iran that they've spoiled their relations with the rest of the Middle East. Qatar gives safe haven to the leadership of Hamas. The leaders of Hamas live in mansions in Qatar under the protection of the Emir of Qatar. And we're allowing Qatar to oversee the money. We say uh, that money, that $6 billion, hasn't come out of the bank account, but it doesn't matter, and this is why. Because Iran has made $80 billion since Joe Biden became president because Joe Biden chose to turn a blind eye to Iran selling its oil. And do you want to know why Joe Biden turned a blind eye to Iran? John Kirby was on television saying, of course, it's climate change. There's a supply and demand issue, and we can't pump more oil out of the United States because of climate change. So, of course, we have to balance supply and demand by allowing Iran to sell its oil on the market. We couldn't embargo. We couldn't block the Straits of Hormuz. We couldn't do any of that because of climate change. I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. He actually made this argument on television that we've got to allow Iran to sell oil on the global market to balance supply and demand because we can't produce more because of climate change. The climate change cult is causing part of the conflict in the Middle East right now because we've allowed Iran to get $80 billion to fund Hamas and Hezbollah, and we've just given them $6 billion to fund the next campaign. No, no, John, I want to just push like back on, on one thing. You said that the sanctions are being uh, enforced. The Iranian exports of oil to China, 2020, 6.6 .6 billion, 2021, 23.1 billion, 2022, 30 billion dollars. So how is that enforcing the sanctions on Iran? We're mindful that uh, Iranian oil is still on the market and it is a global market. That, I mean, uh, that's the, a lot the, of money, supply, right? Supply and demand have to be balanced, but I'm telling you that, that we are enforcing the sanctions and we're adding sanctions to the to the regime. With supply and demand has to be balanced. You got that? Supply and demand has to be balanced. We're allowing Iran to sell oil on the open market. These people are cultists who are causing that. This is absolutely insane to balance supply and demand. We're allowing Iran to sell oil on the open market, $80 billion. That money has gone to fund this invasion. Iran did not need to explicitly be involved in the planning of this operation. They've been funding it and training Hamas and Hezbollah for years, more so in the past few years, because of the Biden administration's willingness to allow Iran to get money, something that did not happen under Donald Trump's administration. In fact, Iran had $7 billion in reserves when Donald Trump was president and now has $70 billion in reserves. All because the Biden administration 
chose to turn a blind eye to what Iran was doing because they could not bring themselves to produce more oil in the United States because of climate change. You keep that in mind and act accordingly. Uh, we got a lot to talk about, including the speaker fight, but I, I, I do have to un- unfortunately continue the familiar theme that we've been stuck with all week. I want to play for you some audio. This is the president of Harvard. This is a moment of intense pain and grief for a great many people in our community and around the world. I feel that pain and grief myself. As members of a university community, we have a choice. We can fan the flames of division and hatred that are roiling the world. Or we can try to be a force for something different and better. People have asked me where we stand. So let me be clear. Our university rejects terrorism. That includes the barbaric atrocities perpetrated by Hamas. Our university rejects hate, hate of Jews, hate of Muslims, hate of any group of people based on their faith, their national origin, or any aspect of their identity. Our university rejects the harassment or intimidation of individuals based on their beliefs. And our university embraces a commitment to free expression. That's the president of Harvard. Now, while that being the president of Harvard, you should know at Stanford University, an instructor made Jewish students this week identify themselves, take their belongings, stand in a corner, and then said, this is what Israel does to the Palestinians, and added that the colonizers killed more than 6 million people, suggesting what Israel has done to the world is worse than what the Holocaust did. I put all of this in perspective for you and then add in this, ABC News complaining about uh, corporations not wanting to hire Hamas sympathizers. Listen to part of this report from ABC News. Over the crisis in the Middle East, students taking sides and clashing while some CEOs are now saying they won't hire people based on their views in the wake of the Hamas attack. Selena Wang is in Cambridge, Massachusetts with more. Good morning, Selena. Good morning, Juju. College campuses are deeply divided, including here at Harvard, where students here, it's not just about trying to protect their safety, but corporate CEOs are trying to blacklist some students whose organization signed on to a controversial statement. This morning, as protests erupt on college campuses across the country over the escalating Israeli-Hamas war in the Middle East, tensions mounting between some of those student protesters and their potential employers. Harvard now finding itself in the middle of contentious conversation after its Palestine solidarity groups released a statement signed by more than 30 student groups in the wake of the Hamas terrorist attacks, saying they held the Israeli regime entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. For the last two decades, millions of Palestinians in Gaza have been forced to live in an open-air prison. CEOs from major corporations like Sweetgreen and FabFitFun calling for the names of the students within those groups to be released. What we wanted to do was um, try to understand, well, who actually is signing on to that statement? And if people are actually signing on to that statement, we would want to be able to make sure that we're not hiring those individuals. Now, notice it is, oh, poor students. The Washington Post this week has a story. Here's the, here's the tweet. The Israel-Gaza war is still in its first week, but some people in the United States and around the world have lost their jobs or face discipline or backlash for their criticisms of Israel. The entire story is, oh, poor pitiful people getting punished for standing on the side of Hamas. Let me read you some headlines over the last two years from the Washington Post. From Margaret Sullivan, so you're being held accountable? That's not cancel culture. From Jennifer Rubin, the GOP's gibberish about cancel culture never looks so dumb. From Philip Bump, cancel culture blends into victim culture. From Max Boot, why we should cancel the phrase cancel culture. Those are four pieces at the Washington Post. And now today the Washington Post is, oh, poor pitiful people losing their jobs 
for signing a statement supporting Hamas. A Fairfax County School Board member in Virginia, Abrar Omish, opposed a moment of silence for victims of the Hamas attacks. Her father is a, a former president of a group tied to the Muslim Brotherhood. She refused to support a moment of silence for the victims in Israel. Now I want to play for you the audio. This is Stephanie Hallett. She's the Charge d'Affaires for the United States and Israel. We don't have an ambassador there right now, so she's the professional diplomat in charge. I want you to listen to the career diplomat of the United States who has been to the border between Israel and Gaza. Stephanie Hallett here, the charge of the U.S. Embassy. I'm here with our senior defense official and defense attache, Captain Frank Schlereth. We've come down here uh, along the Gaza periphery to bear witness to the atrocities that were committed here on Saturday. And it's um, it's really unbelievable. As a, as a mother um, and just as a human being to see and to know what happened here um, is, is really important uh, to say that we've been here, we've seen it, and it is evil. Um, and we stand with Israel, uh, all of us, we stand with Israel. You could hear the emotion in her voice by what she saw. Dead people, dead children, death, the smell of it. Y'all, I want to read for you a comment that was left on my Instagram last night by a model. This is what she writes. So Hamas broke through Israel's extreme, in all caps, protections, and then went around collecting newborn babies and then beheading them. Emoji of the chin stroking emoji. And how did they know where to find these Holocaust survivors? You speak of that. And how old are they now? Have you ever seen the movie Wag the Dog? All war and killing is bad, and you either condemn both sides or you're part of the problem. <laughs> no, the hell you don't. When good fights evil, you don't take a you don't sit back and say, "Ah, oh, I'm not taking a side here." Today, Hamas is ordering Gazans to stay in their homes as Israel tells them to head south because they're about to invade. Israel gave Gaza residents a day to prepare and is now telling the Gaza residents where they're about to go, please leave, so they don't get killed. And Hamas is saying, no, you want me to take a both-side situation here? There's good and there's evil. There is no gray here. Major media organizations in this nation and around the world are pro-Hamas. In fact, I learned today there's a major media organization in this country, thankfully not mine, that is advising its newsrooms you're not allowed to refer to Hamas as a terrorist organization. You can call them a militant group. This is the BBC. Listen to this reporter from the BBC. My name is Adnan al Bursh, a reporter for BBC Arabic and a resident of Gaza. Here in Ishifa Hospital, bodies lay everywhere. The injured scream for help. You can never forget these sounds. Among the dead and wounded, my cameraman Mahmoud has seen his friend Malik. They didn't do this in Israel. BBC has a Gaza resident in Gaza going to the hospital in Gaza to cover the carnage that they blame on Israel in Gaza. They didn't do this in Israel. They didn't interview the victims. Many of you have long wondered, how is it that the Holocaust could happen? This is how. You have major media outlets in this country that cannot bring themselves to condemn Hamas or even call Hamas a terrorist group. 
you have major universities in this country allowing anti-Semitic protests on campus in the name of free speech. Do a thought. Do, do a thought experiment. Would they allow white nationalist students to march on campus after George Floyd died? Of course not. But whenever it's the Jews, the anti-Jews are allowed to march. The anti-Semites are allowed to march. The pro-Hamas ralliers are allowed to rally. It's every other cause, they take a side. They find their moral conviction all the time, but never when it comes to Israel. You have people purportedly on the right, the Tim Pools of the world who are online celebrities on the right, who are taking the images, the graphic images out of Israel and say, well, this might have been generated by AI. I want to remind you all of something. And I can remind you from the shared story of the world's three great religions, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Look, look at what the devil does. He twists it. He acts like he has some special knowledge. If he did, he would know God didn't say you must not eat of any tree in the garden. He just twists it ever so slightly. And then he says, you will surely not die, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And look where we are today. In the muddied waters after the fall, there are a lot of people who can't even figure out what evil is. Hamas, in an unprovoked attack, killed babies and grandmothers and Holocaust survivors. They live stream it on Facebook pages. There are pictures. We see and the, have heard the interviews of the parents of the victims, of the survivors of the attacks. And you have a bunch of people online, a bunch of people marching in the streets, a bunch of people on television saying, did it really happen that way? How can we trust the media? How can we believe our own eyes? Maybe, maybe you know, Israel's response, that's bad too. We should condemn all of it. So here's the regular pattern. The terrorists get to kill the Jews, and when the Jews respond, ah, oh, it's both sides are so bad right now. We 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 can't how how can we allow this to happen? We need a ceasefire now. Every time the good guys prepare to respond, evil says, Oh no, 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 ceasefire, ceasefire. If you're on that side, I do want you to know you're on the side of evil. I do want you to be very clear here. If you believe Israel cannot respond because of collateral damage, you are on the side of evil. Evil provoked this. Hamas is an evil organization. They killed women. They raped women. They killed children. They raped, raped children. They killed Holocaust survivors who they found in the streets of Israel. They killed the young. They killed the old. If you say, oh, well, Israel can't respond now because there may be collateral fallout, there may be innocent people killed, Israel worked to allow the innocent people to flee before attacking, Hamas refused to allow them. If you can't see that, if you can't recognize that, you're on the side of evil. You want to see how the Holocaust happened? The Holocaust happened by people who believe in their own innate goodness, refusing to take the side of good, and instead throwing up mud and smoke so they don't have to see what actually happened, so they can abdicate their own responsibility for the truth. That's how the Holocaust happened. And you can see them trying to have it happen again. They do not like the Jews. They do not like Israel. They are anti-Semites. And they're behaving like the devil in the garden. Did this really happen? Did God really say? They're on the side of evil. There are only two sides here. You deciding to sit it out and say, well, both sides are bad. You're on the side of evil, and you need to look in the mirror and just call yourself evil because that's what you are. Well, let's get into the events of the day and what's happening in Israel. Here is Donna Brazil on ABC News. I play this clip of her for a particular reason. She's talking to the left. 
heard from George W. Bush. Our new poll uh, looked at this just out this morning. U.S. responsibility in the Middle East found that 55 percent say uh, the U.S. has a responsibility to fight terrorism, 53 percent responsibility to protect Israeli citizens, but less than a majority to ensure peace. So there, there's not a lot of appetite among American voters for broad U.S. involvement, but there is support, perhaps not as strong as I would have thought it would have been, but there is support uh, 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 for a strong U.S. support for Israel. There's no question about it. And look, we just we just finished or got out. I don't know the right word, but, you know, we were in the Middle East fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I'm sure there's no appetite. And some of that is the, the hard partisanship we see. But more importantly, this is a this is a moment where the American people must understand what's at stake. The hostages, including Americans, we have to understand that Israel is our ally, and yet we have to be prudent in how we use our military might and strength in that region. This is the president of Israel. So let's first understand what type of hostages. Who are these hostages? Babies, pregnant women, elderly people with dementia, even with their caretakers, families, innocent civilians. Of the, of, with, from, 30, from 36 nations, people were killed or abducted. From 36 nations. Okay, there is Natalie from Chicago who came with her mother to spend a weekend of a holiday in Nachal Oz, in a kibbutz on the border. In, incidentally, a kibbutz advocating peace all throughout its history. And she's there in Gaza, and nobody knows their, her whereabouts, and so many other Americans, and so many other people. And, 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 this, and this living in, in not knowing where, what's their whereabouts is, is hell. Actually, this paradise place turned into hell. And it is our obligation to move it from being hell to back to being paradise. And part of it is to bring back the hostages immediately with no conditions back to Israel. There is incidentally a big international effort on that respect and I must say that the American administration and President Biden has been incredibly supportive and we are utterly grateful to him, the American nation and all our friends and supporters throughout the world. One more bit of audio here. This is Ron DeSantis. Uh, he was making the rounds on the talk shows this weekend. So DeSantis, and we'll, we'll spend a little more time on this Specifically later, DeSantis chartered a plane, uh, I believe using campaign funds, uh, and got it to Israel, was able to round up 300 Americans, and they landed at Tampa uh, International Airport last night. He met the people as they came. You could say, well, it's a PR stunt. Uh, maybe so, but it's a pretty good PR stunt. Uh, nobody else has done this, including Joe Biden who at best is putting Americans on boats and getting them to Cyprus and making them pay the administration for the rescue. DeSantis did this. Uh, the people who took those flights, the 300 of them, uh, no reimbursement to the state of Florida or to DeSantis for doing it. Uh, the Biden administration making people reimburse the government. Uh, this is DeSantis on the issue of Israel and the bright lines of war. We don't have a clear definition of success from the Israeli prime minister either. Uh, I asked the national security advisor, uh, and he just said well, generally safety. I actually think we do. The Jewish state. I think we do with all respect. I mean, I think, I think he has said that uh, it is the, the total and complete defeat of Hamas uh, where they're no longer existing uh, as a functioning entity. I think that that is achievable. I think Israel, Israel can do that, and I think they have every right, and indeed I think they have the duty to do that. Amen. One of the things that we're hearing is this idea of proportionality. Their just war doctrines and proportionality, all these things. It's funny how they're, they're suddenly coming back into vogue to insist that Israel engage in some level of proportionality in response to Hamas, that they don't just go in and nuke Gaza. The people who are using proportionality, though, essentially mean that, that Israel, that they can't use violence to stamp out Hamas. When they talk about proportionality, what they sound like they're suggesting is that Israel needs to go in and selectively kill 1,400 Palestinians, chop off the heads of 40 babies, uh, rape a dozen women, 
uh, maybe find one pregnant woman, uh, disembowel her and her child, stab the, the child to death, and then kill the mother. That's what Hamas did. That's what Hamas did. I don't want to tone it down for you. You need to understand this, that uh, it's, it's documented evidence. It is documented that Hamas cut a child out of a woman while the mother was still alive. And then killed them both. That's what Hamas did. Hamas took tires off of cars and set the tires on fire and rolled them into houses to burn down houses where they couldn't get into the safe rooms of the Jews inside. And so they burned the houses down, cooking the Jews inside. That's what they did. There's this, this nasty little strain of, of people on the left and the right who were saying, oh, it's AI-generated pictures or it didn't really happen or show us the beheaded babies or else we're not going to believe you. And along the way, they say, well, there's got to be a proportional response. What do they actually mean? Here's what it actually, not what they mean, but what it actually means is what response must Israel mount to stop this from happening again? If five men with guns from Gaza came across the the wall, they each had 10 rounds in their magazines, so you had 50 bullets, they fired 50 bullets, and they all were gunned down and dead. Israel going into an all-out war leveling Gaza would be disproportionate. You don't bomb Gaza because five people came across with guns. That would be disproportionate. But this is the political regime of Gaza. Hamas is the political regime. Hamas is the government. Hamas runs Gaza. The people of Gaza elected Hamas. Hamas places its infrastructure in hospitals, schools, and mosques to maximize casualties. And then Hamas plays a game with many members of the Western media where they say, no, no, Israel can't respond in kind because that would be disproportional. Look at the civilians that would die. Uh, Israel just had, I want to give you this number. This number is real. It's a statistic that I'm not making up. Hamas killed one-tenth of one percent of all the Jews on planet Earth in their attack. One-tenth of one percent of all the Jews on planet Earth are dead on a weekend because of Hamas. That's a lot of people. Proportionally for Israel, that's 1,440 of its citizens. That's now 30 Americans. It went from 14 Americans to 30. There are now 199 hostages. What's the proportional response? It's to end Hamas's ability to wage war. And if that means you have to blow up buildings, including hospitals and schools in Gaza, because that's where Hamas puts its rockets, that's where Hamas puts its headquarters, that's where Hamas puts its people, so be it. Innocent Israelis died, yes. Innocent Gazans are going to die. The rules of proportionality of war do not preclude innocent people from dying. The rules of proportionality of war are the response must be merited in size and scope to stop what happened from happening again. And the only way you stop from happening what, again what happened is you exterminate Hamas. You treat Hamas like roaches and you spray enough roach killer that they all die. And in this case, the roach killer is in the form of rockets and missiles and bullets and soldiers on the ground in Gaza. Hamas is refusing to allow Gaza residents to go south. But I want you to note the contrast. The contrast that gets glossed over by all the people in the media who are taking the pro-Hamas side. By the way, did you know that if you have a reporter in Gaza, that reporter has to be blessed by Hamas? It has to be someone from Gaza who Hamas sanctions. So the BBC Gaza-based reporter 
is a reporter that Hamas said could be a reporter. Do you really think that person's going to give you anything other than the pro-Hamas spin? They're not, because if they do, their family's going to get killed by Hamas. The BBC has had to suspend one of its reporters. The Associated Press has had to suspend another one. Why? Because the Associated Press reporter, sanctioned by Hamas, was on Twitter talking about death to the Jews. Not exactly fair and balanced. Israel has to eradicate Hamas. Now, I want to put this all in in clear perspective for you. Hamas went across from Gaza into Israel without notice, without warning, using paragliders, something they've never done before. They killed 1,440 Israeli citizens. They killed Holocaust survivors and babies. They killed women. They killed men. They killed children. They killed indiscriminately. They burned houses down where people were hiding in the houses. We now have eyewitnesses who were at the music festival where Hamas called for people to come out of hiding, that it was all over, they were safe, and when they came out, they shot them. And then there were people at the concert who laid on the ground pretending to be dead, and Hamas poured gasoline on them and set them on fire. So those who were hiding, those who were playing dead, they had to decide, flee for it and actually die or stay and be burned alive. They did it with no notice. They did it with no provocation. They did it because Hamas believes that Israel should be destroyed. Hamas's statement in its political charter is the destruction of Israel and the death of Jews. That's in their political charter. The destruction of Israel and the death of Jews is in their political charter. How did Israel respond? Israel responded by telling the residents of Gaza, you have 24 hours to get out. And days later is now telling them, hey, we're going to attack northern Gaza, so go south. It's Hamas blocking them. What do you think would have happened had Hamas said, hello, Israel, in 24 hours, we're going to invade southern Israel in the kibbutzes, and we're going to kill people? What do you think Israel would have done? One, evacuated the areas, and two, taken up arms to defend themselves, what would have happened? But Hamas didn't do that. They sneaked over so they could maximize the death. We now have documentary evidence obtained by NBC News off the dead bodies that Hamas soldiers were instructed to attack schools and places where children would be to maximize the casualties. And the children were the least likely to fight back and would have the most traumatic impact on Israel. So kill the children. This is obtained by NBC News from the dead bodies of the Hamas soldiers. And what is Israel's response? To give people of Gaza time to leave so that they can go in and wipe out Hamas. They're already innocent dead. Israel, in responding to Hamas, they're going to be innocent Palestinians dead as well. But the reality is as well, the Palestinians elected Hamas, put them in as political power. They haven't changed anything. They haven't pushed back on, on Hamas putting their weapon strongholds in schools and hospitals, putting their headquarters in schools and, and hospitals and mosques. Yes, there's going to be fallout, but it's because of Hamas. It's not because of Israel. No one in pa- the Palestinian territory would be dead this week had Hamas not attacked Israel and killed 1,440 of its citizens. One-tenth of one percent of all the Jews on planet Earth are dead because of Hamas. Israel gets to respond, and the proportionality of that response is not an equivalent response. The proportional response is the response necessary to ensure this does not happen again. And the only way Israel ensures that is to eradicate Hamas from the face of the earth. And that's what they should do. Now, we got to switch gears. I do want to move our focus overseas. President Biden goes to Israel tomorrow. I have a question. Are y'all really ready for this? Have you steeled yourselves for what's coming? Historically, Hamas runs a very successful playbook. Here's what happens every time Israel engages Hamas. Members of the media run out and say, what about the poor, innocent Palestinians? Happens every damn time. 
Hamas is the elected political leadership of the Palestinian territory of Gaza. The people of the Palestinian territory of Gaza elected Hamas their leadership, knowing Hamas's goal stated in their political charter right now. Right now, Hamas believes in the eradication of Israel and the Jewish people. That's Hamas's stated goal currently. Hamas's stated goal is not to provide for the people of Palestinian territory. It's not to provide good government. It's not to provide resources. It's not to provide education. It's not to provide security. It's not to provide jobs or food. Its job, its stated goal, is the eradication of Israel and the Jewish people. That is Hamas's goal. And the Palestinian people put Hamas in charge knowing that. And what has Hamas done since? To maximize casualties in order to win a PR battle, Hamas builds its weapons in schools and hospitals and mosques. It builds its weapons in highly congested urban areas. So if Israel blows up a weapons depot in Hamas territory, they're blowing up something in the middle of a city and it gets lots of innocent people killed. On top of that, the reporters who work in Gaza have to be approved by Hamas. So when the BBC or MSNBC or the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation rushes a reporter in to show the wounded and the dead in Gaza, they're using someone who is certified to be a Hamas propagandist, and they don't tell you on television. They don't tell you that that uh, Abdul Ali of the BBC, Hamas knows where his mother and father and brothers and sisters and children all live. And if he screws up, they're all dead. He doesn't tell you that. He doesn't tell you that he's pro-Hamas and also a hostage and that his family will die if he says anything that might be useful to Israel. He doesn't say that. The network doesn't say that. But that's commonly what happens. Did you know that? I bet you didn't, but it's God's honest truth. The president of the United States has told Israel, you should eradicate Hamas. What they did was awful. 1,400 plus Israeli citizens dead. Today, they interviewed a doctor performing body identification. The charred remains of a man as they worked to try to find recoverable DNA. They realized it wasn't just the man, but also the man's child. Tightly gripping, hugging in the fetal position, his child. They were burned alive together. Their bodies fused carbon to carbon as they burned. You shouldn't have to see it. You shouldn't have to think about it, but that's what happened. And Hamas is going to drag the cameras in to Gaza and make sure everyone sees every dead Palestinian and says, why is Israel doing this? And their goal is to make you forget due to the horror of war, you have the attention span of a goldfish, to forget what provoked this. They want you to ignore that Hamas started this. They want you to pretend that what Hamas did was not nearly so bad as what the Jews are doing in response, as what the Israelis are doing, because all these people are in an urban area, but they're in an urban area that Hamas won't allow them to leave because Hamas believes it gets international blessing and favor when there's a mass casualty event, because the world loves to blame Israel anyway, loves to blame the Jews, loves to hate the Jews, loves to love the Palestinians. You have a sympathetic press corps to the Palestinians. You have 
sympathetic world governments to the Palestinians. And the bigger the body count, the better it is for Hamas, because then that forces the world to bring pressure to bear on Israel to cut it out. If you want to cut it out, you got to get rid of Hamas. You want to get rid of Hamas, you got to exterminate them. You want to exterminate them, you have to go into Gaza. You go into Gaza, there's going to be a mass casualty event. There's no other way to stop Hamas. And if you do not stop Hamas, you will not stop the cycle of violence that led to a father and his child being fused together in a carbon mass because Hamas burned their bodies. Are you ready for this? Do you have the stomach for what's coming? I want to prepare you in advance. You, the people of the United States and the world, are about to be subject to an amazing PR campaign run by Hamas designed to get Israel to stop getting rid of Hamas. You, the people of the United States of America and the world, are going to be subjected to a sustained PR push echoed by members of the media that is put on by pro-Hamas sympathizers and reporters from Gaza who are on Hamas's payroll working for international news organizations designed to show what Israel is doing in the worst possible light to make it look like Israel is engaged in crimes against humanity and that Israel's response is disproportionate to what Hamas did given the death toll. And they will not tell you Hamas arranged for the death toll. They will not tell you that Hamas arranged for its weapons labs to be in schools and hospitals and mosques. They will not tell you Hamas refused to allow people to leave. They will not tell you that Hamas is dispersed within the population to maximize casualties when Israel comes after them. Hamas will do everything possible to get favorable media sympathetic coverage and make people say, oh, Israel, they're so mean, they're so bad. Look at what they're doing to the poor Palestinians. And they will encourage you to forget about the 1,400 Israelis dead. They will force you to forget about the decapitated babies who they already say didn't even happen. Never mind there were pictures. Never mind there were eyewitnesses. Never mind the reporters who saw it for themselves. Hamas has told you, and many of you already believe, it did not happen, even though it did. Hamas will use social media influencers on the left and the right to vilify the Jewish people. Hamas will use reporters at CNN and MSNBC and the BBC and the New York Times and the Washington Post every major media outlet they possibly can to show the horrors of what Israel has done and please pay no attention to the horrors of what Hamas did to provoke a response. Are you prepared for what's coming? Do you have the stomach to stand on the side of good versus evil? And when they complicate it to negate the moral clarity Are you going to be willing to stand firm and say this is awful and it would not be had Hamas not killed 1,400 people? This is awful and it would not be if Hamas allowed people to flee. This is awful and it would not be if Hamas did not set up shop in urban areas to design, design to maximize casualties if Israel responds. Will you have the stomach to stand up and say, this is not Israel's fault, this is Hamas's fault? Will you have the stomach? Because this is the well-worn playbook that Hamas uses time and time again, and every time it seems to work, every time they seem to get all these people to say, oh, poor pitiful people of Gaza who voted for Hamas and put them in power, oh, poor pitiful people of Gaza who Hamas uses as human shields, oh, poor pitiful people of Gaza who fund Hamas, oh, poor pitiful people of Gaza who won't stand up to Hamas, oh, poor pitiful people of Gaza who cheer on Hamas when they kill the Jews around the world, oh, poor pitiful people, how could Israel do this to you? How could Israel do it? They could do it in response to a terrorist organization. Major media outlets in this country and around the world refuse to even call a terrorist outlet. Hamas is a terror outlet. They're not a militia. They're not a government movement. They are a terrorist group in charge of territory. They're worse than ISIS because the people of Gaza put them in charge. Y'all, are you prepared for it? Do you have the stomach for it? 
when you see the well-orchestrated PR campaign and the pictures and the horror of Gaza, will you remember the 40 beheaded babies? When you see the dead children of Gaza pulled out of rubble, will you remember it's because Hamas put their rocket launching facility in their school? When you see the women in the street screaming, rolling on the ground, sorrow and mourning because their children have been killed by Israelis, will you remember Hamas cut a child out of a woman's womb while she was still living and then shot her in the head and killed her infant out of her stomach? Will you remember that? When you see the man in Gaza crying because all of his sons have died. Will you remember his sons aligned themselves with a terrorist regime that went into Israel and killed sons and fathers and burned them alive? Are you prepared for what's coming? Do you have the stomach to withstand the scenes that will be designed to maximize your sympathy for a terrorist regime and the people who put it in power? There are innocent Gazans. There are innocent Palestinians. Israel has asked them to flee. Hamas has demanded they stay. When what is coming comes and they die, who will you blame? The Israelis who told them to leave or Hamas that made them stay? The Israelis who unprovoked were mass murdered by Hamas or Hamas? Who committed the mass murder? On whose side will you stand? You can't say no side. Some of you want to say no side. No side is also a side, and that's standing on the side of Hamas. That's what Hamas prefers you to do, is say, I refuse to get into this. I refuse to get my hands dirty. I refuse to make a moral judgment. In so doing, you've made the moral judgment to stand with Hamas. You can nuance it all you want. You can sleep well at night knowing you're purer than thou by refusing to get your hands dirty, but your hands are covered in blood. You've stood on the side of Hamas. You've fallen for their PR campaign. You've fallen for their high-minded neutrality. Hamas mass-murdered our allies. They mass-murdered more than 30 Americans, some of whom they still hold hostage. And you're going to sleep well at night say, not my problem? It will become your problem. You will be made to care. The question is, whose side will you care for? The PR campaign orchestrated by Hamas or the Israelis who responded to an unprovoked evil campaign against them. You got to choose people, even if you don't want to. You will be made to care, even on this issue. We've got to begin with the mysterious case of the hospital that didn't actually blow up. I want to play for you now. Uh, this is uh, Sarah uh, Sidner on CNN. She's with Tal Heinrich, who is the spokeswoman for the Israeli prime minister. Listen right. to this One exchange. last thing, I have yeah. to ask you about yeah. the hospital. There have been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of confusion. We cannot obviously verify it ourselves. Israel has come out with some information saying, look, we have proof. But you did have someone who is a reservist uh, who went online. He's also an influencer. He went online and he made these statements that basically Israel had bombed this hospital because there were, as he put it, Hamas terrorists inside. He then took that down. That went all over the world. Is he right? Is that true? And how do you prove otherwise? So I'm not personally familiar with this specific reservist and, and, and the comment that he made and what he posted, what he took down. But um, first, um, there is an abundance of evidence that Israel was not behind that strike, that it was a missile that fell short inside the Gaza Strip. The U.S. president just confirmed that based on the evidence that we have shown him. Uh, and also, there is an abundance of, of other evidence, including videos and, and, and this um, phone call between Hamas militants that was intercepted, in which they basically admit that it wasn't, it wasn't us. Um, so there's no doubt about that. But it is very concerning uh, that there is some, you know, disinformation out there. And we have to be very, very accurate when we address such issues because it, it, it can cost lives. Yeah. Not only did it cause violence, it's called riot, caused riots around the world. Here is Joe Biden speaking to Benjamin Netanyahu about the issue. And based on what I've seen, it appears as though it was done by the other team, not, not you. But there's a lot of people out there who are not sure. The world's looking. We, uh, Israel has a value set like the United States does in other democracies. And uh, 
and they're looking to see what we're going to do. Now, I want to play for you. Uh, his, his last name is Sanchez. He's a reporter from MSNBC. Listen to this. We should also say that the Israeli military at this point is not providing any evidence to back up its claims that this was a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket. They are citing intelligence that they have not yet made public. We should also say that this kind of death toll is not what you normally associate with Palestinian rockets. These rockets are dangerous. They are deadly. They do not tend to kill hundreds of people. And this is the IDF spokesman talking to Anderson Cooper last night. Was the IDF conducting any airstrikes or artillery fire in that area in Gaza City around the time of the explosion? And were any rockets coming from Gaza City? Rockets were coming from Gaza City, and we released that to the media. Basically a print screen of our rocket radar, where there's a red dot where the rockets were fired from, and we can see the direction of the rockets that were fired, which go straight from where they were fired from, above the hospital, and then towards Israel. Many of the rockets continued into Israel and were intercepted by the Iron Dome, and one of those rockets misfired, uh, exploded, and then landed uh, close to the hospital in that uh, area of the parking area of the hospital. And uh, we, so we have, as I said, many sources of information. We don't base our uh, our claims on one source. And as I said before, this isn't just me thinking or saying. This has been approved by the highest levels in the IDF. We stand behind it and we will release the information so that everybody can see for themselves. Um, I am happy to be held to those standards. And I only wish uh, the other side, and I'm not necessar necessarily criticizing CNN, but I, am, I only wish other media would hold uh, the other side, Hamas, a party to a conflict, to the same uh, professional standards of scrutiny and not automatically say, uh, report that this was an Israeli strike on a hospital. Amen and amen. By the way, breaking news, the President of the United States has just lifted off Air Force One, just taking off from uh, Ben Gurion International Airport in Tel Aviv, uh, headed back. All of his uh, consultations with other leaders in that part of the world canceled after this hospital strike. It turns out not to be true. There is a valuable lesson every single one of us needs to learn today, and that is if you want to spread misinformation and disinformation, do not be a COVID skeptic, do not be Donald Trump, do not be a Republican, be a Jew-killing terrorist, and MSNBC and the New York Times will treat you as gospel truth out of the gate. Let me review for you what happened because some of your local newscasts on your local stations probably picked it up as well. That Israel allegedly uh, hit the Baptist hospital in Gaza, killing 500 people. Now, you should know that the Palestinian health ministry that issued that statement is Hamas. Hamas controls the Palestinian health ministry. And you should understand for perspective that Israel right now cannot confirm the number of hostages Hamas has, but Hamas within 15 minutes was able to say, oh, 500 people died. It's really remarkable that Hamas will come out and say Israel just killed 249,000 and three tenths of people and the media rushes out sight unseen, no questions asked and parrots Hamas. But when Israel comes out and says something, you got this Sanchez idiot on MSNBC saying, well, we have to be careful. The Jews lie. That's essentially his point. What about Hamas? Our American media has been obsessed and censorious about disinformation and misinformation. But the moment Hamas says anything, they rush out as if it's the gospel truth. The New York Times on its front page this morning showed the rubble of the hospital in Gaza. There's just one problem. It wasn't the hospital in Gaza. Video has now come out of the hospital in Gaza. The rocket exploded in the parking lot. By the way, Hamas was storing other munitions in that parking lot. And even all the munitions in the rocket didn't blow up the building. It shattered some windshields and cars. Notice what the MSNBC reporter did. 
What the MSNBC reporter said is it's hard to believe that this was a Hamas rocket because normally those Hamas rockets aren't powerful enough to kill the 500 people Hamas says died. Well, it turns out there were not 500 dead people at the hospital in Gaza. In fact, it's questionable whether there were any dead people at the hospital in Gaza, and yet that reporter wanted to cast doubts on Israel. It is remarkable how MSNBC is a propaganda tool for Hamas. It is remarkable how so much of the American media that is so careful in fact-checking Donald Trump not even wanting Donald Trump to be aired live on television because of his supposed lies, will rush out any news spoon-fed to them by a terrorist organization called Hamas. Shame on them. Rashida Tlaib waited days on end. Days she waited before saying anything about the terror attack on Israel. When she did, she did a both sides, oh, we don't want Palestinians to die, Israel needs to be careful, we we, we don't want poor Israelis to die. She said nothing of the already dead. She's now rushed out to condemn Israel bombing this hospital. She's left her tweet up. She won't take it down. It's now been thoroughly debunked. I want you to think about all of the media that you've heard, all the news reports you've heard about Israel bombing this hospital. And I want you to understand it's not true. I want you to think of all the media outlets where you heard Israel bombed the hospital, treating it not as as Hamas says or the Palestinian health ministry says, but as it happened. And I do want you to think about all of the media outlets where you heard the Palestinian or the Gaza Health Ministry claimed and understand that if they didn't say it's operated by Hamas, they're part of the problem. I have no claim to absolute truth. I sometimes get it wrong. I work hard here to correct it when I get it wrong because I want to establish some credibility with you. If I get it wrong, I try to correct myself. Now, sometimes some of you think I'm wrong and want me to correct, and I'm not wrong. I want you to think about all the media outlets that have lectured us on misinformation and disinformation. And I want you to understand what's going on here. The media has rushed very hard to try to do a both sides claim here. They, they don't want to be perceived as taking Israel's side. So they tried very hard to both sides it. They tried very hard to make it look like they're even-handed, but in so doing, Hamas has taken advantage of that to amplify a claim that caused people to march on the American embassy in Lebanon and set it on fire. Noah Rothman writing in National Review, this was a deliberate effort by members of the press, the commanding heights of international journalism, to establish the moral equivalency between Israel and Hamas they appear to need. The psychology that produces acts of unscrupulous malpractice like these is for others to judge what can be said without hesitation is that it won't be the first of its kind. Israel's just war of regime change in the Gaza Strip has not yet even begun and already we're privy to libel and slander. There has been and will be more episodes of tragic violence that typify all wars of the sort, but it would be foolish now to assume the media outlets reporting on this conflict are engaged in a dispassionate effort to chronicle events. Rather, they seek to shape events. In the process, they appear invested in undermining not only Israel's geostrategic position, but America's as well. It was the reporting of this event by American and international reporters that caused this summit Joe Biden worked hard over the past 72 hours to arrange to collapse. He was going to meet with the leaders of Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Jordan. They all bailed on him after the hospital because they all believed the propaganda from Hamas willfully. Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, they used Western press reports to inflame sensibilities. It was Western media outlets that have spent years lecturing us on Republican truth-telling and Donald Trump who rushed to tell the lie, who rushed to disrupt the situation with this, this 
conference who sent people storming the American embassies in several countries. And it wasn't true. The media that lectures us on disinformation and misinformation fell for it. Even now, the disinformation, misinformation reporter at NBC News, Ben Collins, is out there doubling down on this. But people died. But people died. Really? Have we seen the bodies? We've seen the Israeli dead, and people online don't even believe them. We don't see any dead here, and people believe it. It's remarkable how uh, when the Israeli dead are shown on video and in, uh, and in photographs, people are like, I don't know that that's real. The very same damn people when Hamas says 500 people died in Gaza without seeing any footage, any bodies, either. they're like, well, of course, 500 people died. The Jews did it. It's remarkable how the people who will not believe their own eyes when it's Israeli dead are willing to believe nothing but propaganda when it comes to Hamas. That tells you everything you need to know about where so many people stand in this. The people who say they haven't picked a side, they've picked a side. The people who've stood with Hamas, they're on the same side. And that side is what we call evil. And the American press corps, by doing what Satan did in the Garden of Eden and in the wilderness to Christ, did God really say they're collaborators with that evil? Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchases, full work limited by law, 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.